Good afternoon. Uh, Professor Ronald Carstens invited me to address any subject connected with what the intellectual tradition has to say about our troubled natures. Uh, and I hesitated between talking about the pursuit of truth on the one hand, or about how we love, what Christianity has to say about how we love. Uh, and I decided in the end to uh, talk about love. I mean, if I get snowed in, I could talk about truth tomorrow. <laughs> I decided to talk about, about love because I think this is often our greatest experience of joy, but also where we are often most troubled often a place of pain and searching. And also because, you know, yesterday was the feast of St. Valentine's. And I really should have actually talked about that yesterday. It reminds me uh, of my uncle Herbie. He was an uncle by marriage. He wasn't a Catholic. He was married to my mother's sister, Margaret. My aunt Marky, we always called her. And she died. And a few years later, he telephoned me on the 12th of February, about 10 years ago. And he said, Timothy, could you please come and see me as soon as possible? He lived right up in the north of Scotland. So I, I flew up to Perth. And within uh, about midday on the 13th, uh, there I was with him. And it was evident that he was dying. And he said to me, he said, well, you know, I should have become a Catholic years ago. I suspect he didn't. He didn't want his wife to say, well, I was right all the time. <laughs> but his four children were waiting downstairs, and I guessed this. I plucked my oils out of my pocket, and the children came up, and we all anointed him. In fact, he just received one sacrament after the other. And then, and he said to me, he said, Timothy, tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day. He said, I'd like to give your Aunt Marky a surprise. Oh. And so we were with him when he died at 2 o'clock in the morning on the Feast of St. Valentine. I want to start by talking about the love that we may have for people that we know people that we meet, people that we live with. And then I'll conclude with a, a few much briefer words about what it might mean to love people who we've never met, humanity, people who are strangers and aliens. I've just written these words when uh, one of my Irish brethren walked into the room and he said, what are you writing about? And I said, well, Vivian, I'm writing about love. And he says, you're not going on about that old stuff, are you still? <laughs> so to impress him, I read out a chunk from an Egyptian novel, The Map of Love, by Adaf Swef. Forgive my pronunciation. There we read, Ishk is the love that entwines two people together. Shagaf is the love that nestles in the heart chambers of the heart. Hayam is the love that wanders the earth. Tif is the love in which you lose yourself. That's what's my notes. <laughs> Wala is the love that carries sorrow in it. Shabaha is the love that exudes from your pores. Garam is the love that's willing to pay the price. And I said to him, isn't that beautiful, Vivian? And he said, sounds like the menu of an Indian restaurant to me. <laughs> but doesn't that all sound rather erotic and sensual? You might say it doesn't sound like the love of the New Testament, which is selfless and altruistic. And this was the thesis of a very significant book published just before the Second World War by a Swedish Lutheran bishop called Anders Nygren, a book called Agape. And Nygren argues 
that the love of the New Testament is agape, which is selfless, it looks for no return, it's disinterested, and he opposes this to eros, from which we get the word erotic. And he argues that erotic love is ultimately selfish, self-centered, it loves the other for what you can get out of them, the pleasure it might give you, and it might even lead to sex. This Swedish bishop claimed that the original Christian understanding of agape, disinterested love, was contaminated by eros, pagan eros. And guess who the culprits are? It's the usual culprits. It's the Catholics. <laughs> and his hero is Martin Luther, who he claimed brought us back to that original New Testament love, which seeks no return, loves for its own sake. Pope Benedict, first encyclical, Deus Caritas Est, God is love. And I think this exemplifies Nigren's idea of Catholicism. Because Pope Benedict argues for the fundamental unity of Eros and Agape. The two aspects of the same love. When we love the stranger, when we love unknown people, it's never just disinterested. There's always the potential, maybe to be discovered, of attraction, of wanting to enjoy them. Otherwise, it will be dead and come. It's rather odd that it's celibates, like Pope Benedict or, or indeed Thomas Aquinas, who stress the importance of the erotic dimension of love. Whereas it's this married Swedish bishop who regarded the erotic with suspicion. Maybe we celibates are just too naive. I'm reminded of the Irish bishop who preached what he thought was a tremendous sermon on the beauty of sex. And as he wandered down the aisle afterwards, he heard two women in front of him and one said to the other, didn't the bishop preach a beautiful sermon? And he smiled complacently. And the other one said, well, yes, it's just a pity he just doesn't know much about sex as we do. <laughs> one of my brethren went to celebrate Mass at a convent in Edinburgh, and he rang the front doorbell. And the sister who opened the door looked at him and said, Oh, it's you, Father, is it? We were expecting a man. <laughs> and I think that the Catholic tradition is essentially sane in arguing that every human love needs elements of both eros and agape. It might begin, a love, a particular love may begin being more rooted in one or the other, but both are needed if it is to be human and also if it is to be a sharing in the divine love. Now, by erotic, I do not just mean sexual arousal. Love, erotic love, is, for the purposes of this lecture, that passionate response the beauty and goodness. The way that we're attracted to people that carries us outside of ourselves. It subverts that self-centeredness which destroys all love. It propels us beyond ourselves. It may be sexual. It may be a delight in the being of another person, a friendship, even a delight in their mind. It's our joy in another. And it's that joy which cracks open our self-obsession, which subverts our egoism, 
That's the greatest challenge of all spiritual life, isn't it? To be liberated from the little shell, the self-contained nugget of the self. You remember Noel Coward, the English playwright, who once met a friend he hadn't seen for many years, and he said, he said, there's not time enough to talk about both of us, so let's talk about me. <laughs> I remember a, a Jesuit logician who used to come and stay at Blackfriars in Oxford sometimes. I suspect it was because his Jesuit brethren weren't very keen on him. And once he was wanted on the telephone, and this was before you had cell phones, and one of us tracked him down and found him in the kitchen and said, there you are. And he said, no, here I am, there you are. <laughs> but it's often the attraction that frees us to cherish another's existence for their own sake. Don Patrick Haderman, the abbot of Glen Stall, another of those crazy celibates, he's written about it beautifully. He said, we're all born individuals. We become persons by this expansion of ourselves into the antechamber of the other. Love is the only impetus that is sufficiently overwhelming to force us to leave the comfortable shelter of our well-armed individuality and to crawl out nakedly into the danger zone beyond, the melting pot where individuality is purified into personhood. So we need the shock of that attraction to another. It's like the, it's like the ejector seat which propels us out of our own little balloon so that we become people, persons. But isn't this sort of deep attraction to another rather selfish, as the bishop argues, the Swedish bishop? Aren't I just drawn to another because of what I can get out of it? What is selfish, or intellectual stimulus, or the enjoyment of being with them? Isn't it more Christian, as Nigrim argues, just to love without any expectation of being loved in return? But an agape, without a touch of eros, would be inhuman. Imagine saying to somebody, I love you. It is my Christian duty. <laughs> I must do so. Be warned, if anybody said that to me, uh, they might get punched on the nose. W.H. Auden said, we are put here on earth to love others. What the others are here for, I do not know. <laughs> a Dominican may be assigned to Blackfriars, who I find rather dull and uninteresting and boring. Actually, it's never happened yet, but theoretically one can imagine this possibility. If I love him, then I am gambling on the fact that I may eventually discover how he is indeed delightful. And a sexual passion which had no reverence for the other, but gave them no space, that didn't have an element of selflessness in it, would be no more human than scratching your nose. It wouldn't be truly erotic. I don't know whether you've ever seen a film by Fellini called Amacor. It was one of my great favorite films. And it begins almost with an embarrassing uncle. Always my dread in life is that I will turn out to be an embarrassing uncle. Anyway, this one has this man who climbs up a tree and he shouts out, Voglio una donna. I want a woman. Well, I haven't done that yet, anyway. <laughs> but, of course, what he really wants, he doesn't want a woman. He just wants sex. He doesn't want anyone. His lust is entirely impersonal. 
And so it is bound to be empty and frustrating. In 1984, the hero asks uh, someone before they have sex, do you like doing this? I don't mean simply me. I mean thing itself. Isn't that chilly? The thing itself. Cold and clinical. So I think that any sexual relationship that doesn't have that reverence, that giving a space to the other, wouldn't even be really erotic. So any love needs both of these dimensions. To be drawn to the other, attracted in some way, there must be at least a little bit of a desire to say, it's wonderful that you exist. Otherwise, our love would be dull duty. That's the erotic in the broad sense of the word. Drawing us out of ourselves. But every love also needs the dimension of agape, in which we love the other without trying to take them over or consume them. My brother, St. Thomas Aquinas, I love saying that. My brother, St. Thomas Aquinas, as usual, got it entirely right when he said, in love the two become one, yet remain distinct. Eros pushes me to unity, so I want to merge with the other person, become one. So the Augustine wrote of friendship, I agree with the poet who called his friend the half of his own soul, for I felt that my soul and my friends had become one soul in two bodies. But agape preserves the independence of the other, stops me gobbling them up, lets them be in themselves, and sometimes by themselves. If we just had eros, we might devour other people like chocolate puddings. There's a woodman I know, a friend of mine, who so deeply desires union with her husband that her husband is always retreating to avoid being extinguished. He needs to breathe. And the more he fights for space, the more she clings hard. But if we just had agape, the love would be cold, inhuman. We must be both one and distinct. I think this tension between unity and distinction is beautifully caught in a novel about the Second World War written by the Australian Thomas Keneally, The Widow and Her Hero. And she writes a wonderful poem which I think beautifully expresses the equilibrium which is necessary to any human ultimately divine love. The first part of the poem expresses her attraction. And in love's bed, caresses seemed a holy vacuum, since lovers seek to force the air from every cavity and intervening space. Love's pressure is enormous, and the normal terms of gravity become trite. So that's the erotic squeezing out every separation. But then she describes how she has to let him be, give him his independence. He's a soldier. He has his mission to perform in the Second World War. To love him, she has to let him go. But then I catch his eye and see the shoals and surfs and archipelagos which fill the other mind. The tides that go on running when his tide is spent. The projection of Mercato cannot save me from concluding. Love is the longest distance between two bodies. Very powerful. Then. Love is the longest distance between two bodies. And in letting him go, she isn't somehow withdrawing into an absence, loving less, because love's greatest gift is to let the other be. 
My next door neighbor of 20 years, Herbert McCabe, wrote, What gives us elbow room, what gives us space to grow and become ourselves, is the love that comes from another. Love is the space in which to expand. It's always a gift. To give love is to give the precious gift of nothing. Space. To give love is to let be. Sister Margaret and Sister Pat and I went to see Amour this afternoon. An extremely powerful film. Leaving, I think, all of us a bit sort of uh, drained. And I think it's partly a wonderful film. Don't go and see it if you're feeling a bit depressed. But it's a wonderful film because what, what you really see is a love in which the two are one but they remain two. And what I want to argue is that God's love inhabits this dynamism of intimacy and letting be. Because for us to be loved by God is to receive a love which is so utterly utterly intimate, the very core of our being, You know, St. Augustine says that God is closer to us than we are to ourselves. Or as the Quran says, God is closer to me than my jugular vein. God is at the very core of my being. And to discover God, I have to journey inwards. Discover him in the pulse that gives me life, sustains me in being. This is what St. Catherine of Siena calls the cell of self-knowledge. That sounds Cartesian, even narcissistic. But it is St. Catherine. It's that knowledge that if you really journey to the very core of your being, you discover the one waiting for you, who gives you existence in every moment. So that before, wherever an I were a we, And yet that same God lets us be. The whole of creation is letting be. Let the be light. Let the be squirrels and rabbits and human beings. McCabe again. Creation is simply and solely letting things be. And our love is a faint image of that. So God doesn't jump up and down in front of us and say, hello, look at me. Aren't I wonderful? You might not even notice that God exists. Bertrand Russell said that if when he died he discovered God did exist, he would say to him, well, you should have made your existence a bit more obvious. (laughs) A French Dominican called Michel Van Arda, he doesn't sound very French, I know, but he is. Michel compares God to an English, no doubt as well, an American gentleman who doesn't want to force himself on his guests, just pops his head around the door to see if they're okay and then lets them be free. So God loves us by drawing closer to us than we can imagine, but also by his infinite discretion, an intimacy that demands apparent absence. So Thomas Aquinas says that in this life we are joined to God as to the unknown. A rabbi, Reb Baruch, said, imagine two children playing hide and seek. One hides and the other does not look for him. God is hiding and we're not looking for him. Imagine his distress. And even when God became flesh and blood in a human being. Think of the infinite discretion appearing in a a child born in an unimportant part of the Roman Empire in an inn, noticed only by angels and shepherds. When Jesus draws near to people, it's with an infinite respect, saying often, What do you want? 
What can I do for you? He doesn't force himself on people. I went through a time, not a, as I say, a dark night of the soul, but more a grey evening, when God seemed to disappear. Inconveniently, this was about the time I made solemn profession and was preparing for ordination. God didn't seem to be around. And suddenly, having made solemn profession, all sorts of other things became much more interesting and appealing, like marriage and sex and art and, and drama and having children. And I remember the moment that, in a sense, I discovered the presence of God again. And paradoxically, it was in the Garden of Gethsemane in Jerusalem, the place where God the Father seemed absent in Jesus. And it wasn't suddenly saying, oh, there you are, you're behind the tree. You know. It was more like reconnecting within a depth within myself where God had always been. But I had not been there for a while. So God is the ultimate lover whose presence gives us existence and whose discretion gives us freedom. And this is possible because God is the one with whom we can have no rivalry. We can't compete for space with God because God creates the space in the first place. God does not limit my existence in any way. I don't have to fight for breath because God is the breath in which I breathe. That's why it is so important we learn the first lesson in traditional theology. And I won't embarrass Professor Carstens by asking him what it is. The very, very first lesson which we were taught as young friars which is that God is not a very important, powerful person. Such a person would be a rival. God is not a sort of mega version of the President of the United States. Such a God would crush us. God is the one with whom no rivalry is possible, and therefore intimacy is freeing. And the more close you are, the more God disappears. You know, it's like when you kiss somebody. When you kiss, they disappear from sight. Now, the art of love, I think, is sensing what the other person needs now. I may long for intimacy when she longs for silence. I may long for a hug. She may long for a hug when I want to be alone. And sometimes we don't know what we want. You know, a broody teenager in the storms of adolescence who might want to say, I don't want you near me. Why can't you leave me alone? And at the same time, why doesn't anybody care about me? And we love best when we see what the other needs at this moment. Of course, only God lives both simultaneously. Now, so far, let's see how we're doing. So far, I've been talking about our love with the people that we know. Very briefly, what about Jesus' commandment that we should love the stranger, the alien? even the enemy. What sense can it make to love somebody that you've never met? What sense can it make for me to say, I've got to love you? Well, most of you I've never met before. First of all, we believe it is part of our Christian faith that every person is inherently, intrinsically lovable. If I could only see you as you are, with the clarity of God's sight, 
Of course I would love you. I would be head over heels in love with every one of you. If I do not love you so, it's because I do not yet see you with clarity. I'm looking through a glass darkly. Thomas Merton fled the world because he to become a Cistercian in Gethsemane. Because he thought that most people were so awful. But re- religious life, I think it was about 16 years of religious life, trained him to see people's beauty. If it doesn't do that, it's not worth it. One day, he went down to Louisville to have a, a book printed. And he had this famous experience of, of looking around at people and being bowled over by their beauty and their goodness. He wrote, Then it was as if I suddenly saw the secret beauty of their hearts, the depths of their hearts, where neither sin or design or self-knowledge can reach the core of their being, the person of each one is in God's eyes. If only we could see ourselves as we really are, if only we could see each other like that all the time, There will be no more war, no more greed, no more hatred. Now living this love now, prior to paradise, doesn't mean that you have to have special feelings about people. You may work as a nurse or a teacher or a doctor or a social worker, caring for hundreds of people, without feeling anything about them. You do it by justly marking their papers, by preparing your classes, by changing their bandages with reverence, with care. That is a sign of the love in which you believe, even if you have not yet tasted it. Secondly, We believe as Christians that we're all part of God's love affair with humanity. and It is God's purpose to bring us into unity with each other in Christ. St. Paul wrote to the Ephesians that God's purpose he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. So we're part of each other. And we cannot be complete apart from the whole of humanity. In December 1963, Martin Luther King said, all life is interrelated. Somehow we're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. For some strange reason, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. Until the kingdom, we can't really know fully who we are. And the story of humanity doesn't look like that. It would be easy to read it as a story of competition and rivalry in which the weak go to the wall. It would be easy to read it as a story of the survival of the fittest. Many politicians attempted by a sort of pseudo-Darwinian reading of history, which eliminates those unfit for purpose. Now, I've got nothing against Darwinian theories of evolution. As a scientific theory, it must stand or fall solely on scientific grounds, but it is a deceptive metaphor for human destiny. You see, the book of Genesis looks like a book of rivalry and competition. It gets going when Adam and Eve see God as their rival, and they get thrown out of paradise. And then you have Cain and Abel, you have Sarah and Hagar, 
You have Isaac and Ishmael. You've got Jacob and Esau. You've got Joseph and his brothers. It's quite possible to read the whole of the book of Genesis as one unending story of rivalry and competition and think that is what life is all about. But it's a beautiful, subtle book because what it shows is little tiny hints which suggest that if you look closely, that's not the real history. There's another story which is evolving with the utmost discretion. So when Adam and Eve are expelled and God closed them, and when Cain commits his terrible murder, God protects him. When Ishmael is thrown out, God preserves his life. And when Joseph goes into exile, then it is so that he may prepare for the coming of his brothers. I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sell me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. So what the book of Genesis is arguing is don't be fooled by the obvious story. It's a secret story, what an Irish novelist calls the secret story of the marvelous, which is working its way through divine providence, the working of kindness. I grew up in the, the countryside, and one of the great pleasures of being a country kid is that you learn to see in the dark. One of the pleasures is wandering around in the dusk when night is falling. And the night animals are beginning to emerge. You know, the deer and the, the foxes and the rabbits. Thanks be to God, no bears or wolves in England. Though I was convinced that there were tigers. I remember once my mother saw me, aged about 10, going out into the woods with a big stick. And she said, why do you need that? I said, because there are, are tigers just near the orchard. But what you learn as a kid is you learn to see the little hints of where a path turns. It's not that you see any more than a tiny. You see just the same things. But you learn how to see what portrays a way forward, where there's a, a bend in the path. And I think that's what faith is like. I don't think the believer actually sees in one sense, any more than anybody else. But they can read it and read the small signs of kindness. And in our love for the stranger, for the unknown, there's also surely something of that dynamism, dynamism which we found in our personal loves. We draw close and we must let be. We're touched by the suffering of people in Somalia, for example, suffering from starvation. Or, or people, you remember after that awful earthquake in Haiti, there was a massive response of compassion. Impossible to imagine until the evolution of modern forms of communication. I got an email from a Dominican sister who is working in Haiti. She said, all the world is here, even the Red Crescent from Iran. But in this new intimacy of humanity in our little global village, we have to be careful not to destroy the other, not to overwhelm us. We have to give aid to people in Somalia that doesn't destroy their way of being. I remember going to Albania not long after the fall of communism. The first thing I saw, it was the big golden M. McDonald's had arrived. Somehow, our aid and our care for the stranger has to be immensely respectful of their way of being. Not turning them 
into Americans or even English people. About 18 months ago, I get the date, I went to um, uh, the southern Sudan. Uh, and we were right over by the, um, the, the frontier with the Congo, which is an area overwhelmed by the Lord's Resistance Army murdering thousands of people. Uh, and it was a beautiful experience. I was with Cathod, that's the Catholic, that's the British version of CRS, which I'm a trustee. And what was beautiful is that we had to give aid in a way that enabled and strengthened our partner. The church is the only viable institution in that part of the world. Nothing else works. The church delivers the post, keeps the roads, and protects people, and makes sure there is food. The church does everything. The local church, the local people. So we had to see how we would sustain that in their work, and not try and turn them into ourselves. We have to love them, draw close, and let them be. In our loving of the stranger, we have to learn a little bit of that divine discretion, which lets the other have space, the space to speak their own desires. We have to regard them with reverence, one, but still two. Thank you very much.